Uh, thank you very much for um, inviting me to speak tonight, and it's lovely to be here. Um, yes, I was given a remit, and I, as I said to um, Dr. Smith, who speaks after me, I was sandwiched in between two giants um, in the world of diabetes. Uh, as a pharmacist, though, I said I would concentrate on um, the medication aspect, but really I wanted to make it very patient-centric and to focus on the issues other than just medications that are so important when we're treating patients with complex diseases such as type 1 and type 2 diabetes and, and indeed other forms of the condition. Um, the title of this public health series uh, of lectures is The Rise and Rise of Diabetes. But in tandem with that, as you can see from Professor Rob um, Johnson's talk, it's the rise and rise of research. And I want to focus on that uh, tonight and to show what has actually happened and how we're progressing so um, much further over the last number of years um, in our holistic approach to uh, the treatment of this condition. It is a global pandemic. Um, in Ireland, we have about a prevalence of about 5 to 6%. This is mainly type 2 diabetes, which is the, di the second on, on the list here, which is um, mainly caused by overweight and obesity. Type 1 diabetes, as has been described to you, is, is caused by autoimmune destruction of the beta islet cells of the pancreas. Another important classification of diabetes, however, is gestational diabetes, which is also um, very debilitating for patients and, and can also uh, result in poor outcomes for babies and for mothers. And there are other forms of it, as well, of it as well. Of course, one of the things that we're interested in is the drugs that can cause hyperglycemia or high blood sugars. And we're well aware of those. And of course, corticosteroids, as al has already been alluded to, is one of them. The prevalence of type 1 and type 2 diabetes is about 90% to 10%. And as I said, there's about 200,000, maybe more patients uh, than that with type 2 diabetes in, in Ireland at the moment. The consequences of diabetes are significant in terms of physical impact on the patients who have it, a psychological impact on them, the social consequences, societal consequences, and indeed, of course, economic consequences. We figure that about 10% of the public expenditure um, on healthcare in Ireland is spent on um, the management of diabetes and its complications, and that is not an insignificant amount, perhaps more than one billion euro per annum. Um, as a pharmacist, I just want to briefly go through how we treat diseases and conditions. What is our pharmacological strategy? What are the medicines that we use and how do we use them to treat conditions? If it's as a result of a defect, we try to fix it. If something is absent or deficient, we replace it. If something is reduced or lacking in response, we try to enhance, enhance the response or if we can, replace it also. If something is overactive, we prevent its action. Once treatments do become available, they have to be used in the most appropriate way to ensure that the optimum benefit is obtained for patients. That means that the best medication must be used for that particular patient, so we must have quality prescribing. And after that, of course, we must have active patient engagement. And that's terribly important because we can give them the best drugs in the world, but if they don't take them properly, we do not have those optimum benefits derived. So effective treatment requires more than just medications. At the heart of it, of course, and the most important person is the patient. But we also have the healthcare team. And these, are in the terms of diabetes, involves both primary and secondary care. The healthcare system must be sufficiently resourced to actually ensure that patients are optimised with their treatments. And underpinning all of this is the ongoing research. So just to come back to research, and just to put it, this seems like a very busy slide, but this institution is famous for its research, as Gary has described, across both you know, bench science and into and onto the patient um, in primary care. If you think of a condition <coughs> such as diabetes, the first thing was recognition that it occurred, and that was thousands of years ago. So this is discovery, and that's an observation. The second then is determining causes, and we call this epidemiology. And this is also aligned with scientific research, where they elucidate the reasons why it has occurred. And then we look at where we can use our treatments for this particular condition. This is applied scientific research, a problem and obstacle approach. And then we test these treatments. And this is explanatory research, such as in randomized controlled trials. And after that, of course, we have to see do these drugs, our medications, our interventions actually work in the real world? And we're back to observational research again. <coughs> And then we tie it all together in terms of evidence synthesis. And then we come up with best practice guidelines. And Professor Johnson actually mentioned NICE earlier on. 
and they actually produce best practice guidelines for the treatment of many, many different conditions. I couldn't let this uh, tonight go without alluding to a very important fact. It is a very historical year. It's 100 years since uh, 1916. And this institution actually was the scene of where Constance Markovic and Michael Mallon were actually upstairs, only a few yards from here, holed up during the week of the Easter Rising. But more importantly, 100 years ago, this man, Elliot Johnson, produced a seminal uh, work on the treatment and management of diabetes mellitus. He was actually uh, a doctor who was probably the first who to record data on about 1,000 patients. That's observational research. And he came up with that, all of the factors that actually ameliorated the disease in these patients, and came up with it that if we reduce their calorie intake, if we give them a high protein diet, that it actually worked for these patients. That was seminal. What he actually saw also was that there was still an increased risk of, of death. It wasn't going to work alone. And consider that this was just a few years before insulin was actually discovered. The milestones have already been alluded to. This is Langerhans, who actually discovered the beta islet cells in the pancreas. This is the man Minkowski, who with Van Meering actually discovered that if you took a pancreas out of an animal, that you induced diabetes. And then, of course, we had the quadruple. Um, this is Banting here. There was Collip, McLeod, and Best. They were the four people who actually together uh, discovered the insulin molecule. And from there, then, of course, we have come so far, as has already been described. So the treatment for diabetes, type 1, results in total loss of beta cell function. The absence of insulin with associated clear signs and symptoms of the disease. Raging thirst, weight loss, and lots of voiding of urine. And it requires the administration of insulin to sustain life. Type 2, however, is where we have defective secretion of insulin and then defective action of it. We are resistant to its actual effects. The way the approach to treatment for type 2 is different. We have some tablets that work, but sometimes we require more than one, more than two, maybe three, and sometimes four. Ultimately, an awful lot of patients actually progress to requiring insulin. So while the causes of the disease are vastly different, they actually manifest eventually in the same way and result in the same complications as have already been described. So how treatment with insulin has developed, what remains elusive <coughs> is that we have no oral insulin. It doesn't work. It is biodegraded in the, when you actually take it orally. But that is the goal that we would, or the holy grail that we would love to get to, if it were possible. So what we started with was with animal insulin, but there were problems with this. People were getting hypo and not getting very good control of their condition. Then there was refinement of the insulin molecule where we added bits and pieces onto it, such as protamine and zinc, and this worked much better. There was better control. And then eventually we could synthesize human insulin, which had less problems associated with it. And in the last 20 years, we have had an explosion in the type of insulin analogues that have given finer control, but still the exquisite control of natural insulin has, is, eludes us. And then we have technology coming in where we actually have biosensors, as have been described, that can detect our glucose and then give us an appropriate amount of insulin with it. That has created, as has been seen with the graphs, with blood glucose, very much better control, but it's still not exactly the same as normal physiological insulin. So what you can see here is science and technology intertwined and to make these major advances that have made life for patients with type 1 diabetes so much better. Sorry. Excuse me, sorry. The goal of treatment for type 1, as has already been described, is to mimic insofar as possible the normal physiological secretion of insulin in response to high blood glucose levels. And we want to avoid blood glucose excursions from these normal levels to high hyperglycemia and the consequent, consequent complications to low hypoglycemia. And hypoglycemia is actually more um, serious than hyperglycemia. We monitor diabetes using blood glucose readings, self-monitoring of blood glucose, and of course HPA and one c as well. If one is diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, it is a lifelong uh, condition requiring adherence. This has already been described, I don't need to go through it again, but what um, Professor Johnson described was restoring beta cell function. What we're also looking at, of course, is the causes of type 1, and if we find out what the causes are, then we might be able to, to stop it developing at all and preventing the development of type 1. So this would be, of course, a phenomenal um, uh, impact on patients. Perhaps that will come. It's certainly getting there. 
One of the things, though, with type 1 di uh, diabetes is the burden that it puts on the patients. And some of you may, of course, have type 1 diabetes here tonight. How many times a day do we have to monitor our blood glucose? Five, six, perhaps times, maybe more. And if you're out of control, you might have to wake up in the middle of the night to actually take a blood glucose reading. Maybe four or five insulin injections. A significant interaction with healthcare professionals, not just your doctor, maybe your GP, your consultant, your nutritionist, your eye specialist. You have to do these things to make sure that your disease is kept under control. I tried doing this, this carbohydrate counting for one day this week with my food at home. It is onerous. I know that after a while you would get used to it, but counting all the foods with carbohydrates, transferring it to an insulin dose, and then you know, making it, it like that, it can be very onerous. So the impact is quite significant on patients, and it does require incorporation into a lifestyle and a change in your lifestyle. Living with diabetes can therefore result in significant psychological stress, and there's a lot of research to show that that is true now. People cope very, very well, but there is this low-lying stress. Some people call it this loss of freedom, this relentless decision-making, and an ultimate effect on quality of life. And there's also the potential for the anticipation of complications to cause anxiety. And I would say that children and par parents of children who've been diagnosed ha are under severe psychological stress. So it requires intensive and ongoing support. And the other aspect of Elliot jo Joslin was, was that he um, was a fantastic educator. And he really saw very early on the need to actually educate all patients with diabetes. And this had to be on an ongoing basis. So he quotes here, the diabetic who knows the most lives the longest. Let me turn to type 2 diabetes. It's typically manifested with people who have the central or vis visceral adiposity, this wide girth, this waist. Usually it's associated with chronic fuel surface. That means we have too much fuel on board and it has to go somewhere. So it's often deposited in the girth here. And then it has a variety of effects in the body. And the islet cells may be reduced in type 2 diabetes. There's too much blood sugar in the blood vessels. This causes the damage. You have problems with this visceral adipose fat. The liver doesn't switch off the synthesis of glucose. There's over nutrification of the muscles. And then you also have an effect on the uh, ovaries as well. In terms of the population in Ireland, we may have about 200,000 people with it. But there's a, a large percentage of patients who actually may be undiagnosed or indeed in a pre-diabetic phase, which means that they're at risk of developing the condition. The treatment of type 2 diabetes is clear, prevention. And I know that Dr. Smith is going to talk about that in a moment. The goals of treatment are to avoid persistent elevated blood glucose. We want to aim for a normal blood glucose. We want to delay progression to any of those complications. And we want to minimize the development of the complications. So the management immediately is lifestyle change. It is diet and exercise. If that doesn't work, if there's this continuous um, increase in our no visible decrease in the blood sugars, we must add in medications to control the blood glucose. And indeed, because type 2 diabetes has many manifestations, we may need other medications on top of this for the cardiovascular effects, um, etc. <coughs> in terms of glucose lowering agents, there has been in the last while an enormous increase in uh, the availability of these drugs or the plethora that we have to choose from. For many years, we relied on two classes of drugs, the sulfonylureas here and then laterally metformin. <coughs> but in the last 20 years or so, there has been a massive stride through research and understanding of what caused the condition. And this has made it perhaps more easy to actually choose an agent that works. As part of our work in the National Centre for Pharmacoeconomics, when we do come to actually see uh, new drugs for, for um, cost effectiveness uh, um, evaluation, the characteristics of an ideal agent in this sphere would be, if at all possible, oral, the least invasive method of administration for patients, positive effects on the HbA1c, that they don't uh, tend to put on weight in patients, that they have a low risk of hypoglycemia, do not increase risk of cardiovascular events or indeed other side, have other side effects and low cost. That's really <coughs> utopian. Some of them get some of it right and others not. With these new agents in the last while, we can really see that um, they do work. They work in different ways, but then we see the emergence of side effects. So that there's peaks and troughs. Some agents have come on the market and have gone, been taken off again because of emergent side effects. Ultimately, though, of course, we do see um, the development of the need for insulin 
in not in all patients, but in many of them. So we have so many classes of drugs now, and you can see it's sequential prescribing. Of course, if we had a, a wonder pill that actually lost weight without doing uh, much else and had no side effects, wouldn't that be fantastic for us all? There actually is a pill out there in the market called a self-control pill, and people actually can buy it. One would wonder. I think there's a massive placebo effect, perhaps, but if it does work for some. We do have some medications available for uh, weight loss, and bariatric surgery is an excellent intervention, but it's not for everybody. Uh, out in Lachlanstown Hospital, here where the Professor Donald O'Shea is, he actually does that type of surgery. But of course, it's so easy to say we need to change our behaviour, need to change our lifestyle. That is so hard to do. But, you know, Operation Transformation around this country has shown that some people can actually be involved and very actively, and maybe that's the sea change that we have to see. So, just ending with type 2 diabetes, what I'd like to get across is this is, of course, the Aviva Stadium uh, with Ireland playing rugby. How many of the people who attend the matches here do not know that they've impaired fasting glucose or that they have a diagnosis of diabetes already? They're the people we need to pick up. They need to actually go and get tested. For those patients that actually have the condition, what is their knowledge about their condition? Do they know if they've good control or are they ignoring some of the factors that they shouldn't be? Are they putting on weight? Do they know their number? A lot of patients don't know what their HbA1c is. In my undergraduate teaching at the moment, I, I recommend that all our pharmacists record on the patient medication record what the patient's HbA1c and to have that conversation with the patients to ensure that actually um, they know it and that they have control over it. And in terms of resources then, it is a huge resource. If we're going to have so many more patients captured, perhaps it's going to be a huge burden on the healthcare system, both in primary care and in secondary care, with the consequent economic cost. Innovation solutions to real-time tra tracking of outcomes are required. In Ireland, we don't have linked up databases, as they have in other countries, which would be ideal. What we have is some really good audit work that has shown that there is quite good control <coughs> of blood glucose in pockets of GP surgeries and hospitals and things like that. But what we really want is technology. What we would have would, would be fantastic if we had a patient registry, like Jocelyn did many years ago, but we, that would entail 200,000, maybe more patients. But that is where we would really get a handle on how well controlled these patients are. And that is one of the strategies, of course, for the Healthy Ireland Initiative, which is a policy initiative in the Department of Health here in Ireland. So diabetes management is multifactorial. It requires all of these interventions, ongoing adherence to the medication and medical care, self-monitoring, achieving and maintaining healthy weight, eating healthily. If you don't have diabetes, some of these things are difficult to do. If you have it, how much more difficult is it? It's another added uh, issue on top of it. And for that, we need coordination of services. We, need we, need, we do not need to have defragmentation. We want a holistic approach to care, be it through primary care, secondary care, the healthcare system, and I know they're trying to do it, but under the, we're still suffering a little bit from the under-resources of the last number of years, and then good research, as you're hearing about tonight. And it's not only research in terms of bench science, but also in what's happening to the patients and their feelings about healthcare systems and how they're coping with the illnesses as well. So patient self-management and self-care is very important to support the individual in making all of the behavioural changes required to achieve optimal diabetes control. And these four, these four um, areas here that I just plucked out, it's critical, and they do get excellent care here for the very young and their families. And that's why if we could have a situation where we could actually have beta cell islet transplantation for young children, it would be magnificent. Older children to preteens and their families, <coughs> this is also very important. The stresses of that, making sure that they do not develop any complications because of adverse control during those years. And pumps have gone a long way to doing it, but there is an awful lot of, of it involved for them. And then, as I am the mother of three teenagers myself, I speak to parents who have teenagers, and it's this transitioning from adolescence into adulthood when they want to take control of their own condition, and they can be quite vulnerable as well there. And it's all about that education and that ongoing support that they require. If you're a patient, an adult, living with type 1 or type 2 diabetes, you, have, you suffer from stressors that are normal, the peaks and troughs of life. These also are compounded if you have either type 1 or type 2. I put down here, what should the public know? I think the public should know the symptoms, the acute symptoms of type 1 diabetes. Another fact is that type 2 diabetes can be asymptomatic. 
you can have it for many, many years and not know about it. If you do know about it, at least you can do something about it. And many studies that Dr. Smith will show actually can reverse it. And the other thing is that one of, when I spoke to some of the parents of teenagers, they said, if there's one thing you could say is that if you have a friend who's a diabetic or if your uh, children are friends with pa patients with diabetes, let them be involved. Make sure that they know the signs and symptoms of hypos and talk to, to um, young people with, um, with uh, diabetes. It is very important because being informed is better so that no adverse consequences occur uh, to young people with it. Enhancing self-management, there are many interventions that we can use and I'm going to come to the end now. We have these educational programs that are, are available in Ireland. This is the one for um, type 1 diabetes and this is the one for type 2 diabetes. They're excellent courses. If you're involved in it either as a healthcare provider or as a patient, you really get an awful lot out of it. It starts off the whole self-management um, uh, part in it. And this again comes back to Jocelyn. We can only scratch one back at a time, but we can teach many patients together and each is likely to teach each other and indeed learn from each other. There's a huge move towards e-health as well. There is road for this to, to be enhanced in the care of diabetes and that's actually transcending all chronic diseases. Diabetes Ireland offer great support as well and then there's the whole social media. Some people like it, some people don't, but there is people out there that, and they can help each other online. Finally, of course, mindfulness, deep breathing, there's nothing wrong with that and maybe all of us should practice it and as a recent convert I think it's something that is important to everyone so use it if you can. So what is in the future? Another hundred years of science and clinical research. This is Elizabeth O'Farrell. Now Elizabeth O'Farrell was actually the one who brought the surrender notice up to General Lowe with Porrick Pierce a um, hundred years ago and she of course was a nurse. Back in 1916 we had no insulin. We had no agents to decrease um, blood glucose. In 2016, we have fantastic interventions for uh, the treatment of both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. In 100 years, is it possible? I don't know. Maybe that's a little bit utopian. We can certainly prevent uh, type 2 diabetes. We may be able to prevent type 1. Who knows? And I'll leave you with another quote from somebody I only got to know in the last while. Learn as if you have to learn forever. Live as if you die tomorrow. Thank you very much. Uh, I learned that a healthy lifestyle can help keep diabetes at bay or can actually assist with uh, lowering your insulin levels in especially type 2 diabetes.